come now see me in action You think the come up comes overnight You ain't behind the scenes Trust me these things don't just happen No shade of Gerald Peter, welcome to the Take Flight Podcast. How you doing, mate? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, it's great to meet you, Matt. I've been really excited for doing this. We're sat in Old Street in the White Collar Factory uh, in one of the office group uh, spaces here. And James Bishop from One Fire and Play has been brilliant, giving us a space today. So it's very professional. It's great mics, it's lighting and everything. It's brilliant. So um, I'm really pleased we're doing it, mate. Thank you. Yeah, no problems. So there's loads of things I want to talk to you about. Yeah. As we were speaking a little bit before there, this is a peak performance podcast where, generally speaking, I discuss the stories of peak performers, high achievers, people who have done great things in their life. You made a career out of boxing. You've done loads and loads of things on your journey along the way. I've spoke with people like Tony Jeffries, who's been on the podcast. I went over to LA, actually, and trained with him at, do you know the boxing burn, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. Trained there. That was awesome. Uh, spoke with Isaac Chamberlain, yeah. cruiserweight. Yeah, I know Isaac well. Yeah, so, oh dear. Yeah, no, yeah, he's no. such a legend. He actually spoke at my mental health event earlier in the year as well. Yeah. He's so, just signed with our Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, I'm looking forward to him having his next fight, actually. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I spoke to a few other boxers. I'm chatting with John Ryder next week as well. So it's really... John Moore as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so was, uh, I'm really pleased we're sitting down. And something I wanted to speak to you first about was when I chat with these guys, a lot of them talk about the early years of their career, getting into fighting and boxing. Yeah. And most of them have got you know, different stories, but it's usually to try and get away from either trouble in the streets or other stuff and try and distract them and, and give them something to focus on. But something I've also seen as a bit of a commonality is that, generally speaking, they don't really like it at the beginning. Yeah. So I'm interested to know from you kind of where the boxing journey started and what your kind of first few experiences of boxing were like. Basically, um, I come to um, the UK from Ireland, from Connemara, uh, when I was about six years old. Um, I couldn't speak a word of English. I moved to Bermondsey. I spoke fluent Gaelic. Really? Um, so it was hard because at that point, it was the IRA was really uh, high and all that sort of stuff. So Irish weren't really liked in, <laughs> you know, in England. Um, so I had a, quite an hard start. Um, I turned into a Cockney within about six months. Um, yeah, I was going to say, went, you don't sound Irish. Yeah, I went, I went, to, the, I went to the Fisher Club, um, boxing club, um, because I kept getting bullied. So um, I remember I used to go swimming there and I used to get slapped on the back and oh, I used to hate it and I thought, I've got to do something about it. So um, I thought to myself, right, I'm going to try boxing. And uh, I went to the boxing gym and uh, I started boxing. Um, then my mum left left us. So my mum left my dad with four kids. Uh, so I had a sister and two brothers. Um, so that it become even harder then. Like I say, I see more dinner times than dinners. You know, it was it was it was hard. So basically, my only way out was to go to the go to the gym. And basically, I started boxing because they used to go to these big boxing shows in these hotels and used to get meals and things like that. So basically, that's why I started boxing. You know, no so I, I got a, I got a meal. You know, uh, when I went to these boxing events and that. Do you remember like was it one particular person who who guided you, like mentored you, or something to take you to the gym, or yeah. was it off your own back? Yeah, no, it was off my own back. But um, you know, it's it just about surviving and. Um, Steve Iser was the trainer there. Obviously, he trained the great Lloyd Lanigan. Um, obviously, he beat Don Curry. Probably one of the best British wins ever in boxing. Um, yeah, and he, he got him. He was like he was like a dad to me because my dad was always out of work. My dad was working seven days a week, like to bring four four kids up. You know, it was it was hard. It was hard them days. We moved. But there was nine of us in one one flat, um, a two bedroom flat. Um, then we got ended up getting our own own, own place. And when we got our own place, that's obviously when my mum left. Yeah. Was there anyone else in your family who was in boxing? No. Just no. you? Yeah, just me. Just me. Wow. And what do, you, what do you remember from your experience, like walking in the boxing gym first time? I walked in the boxing gym. Um, little fat kid, nearly as I am now again. <laughs> obviously enjoying retirement. Um, no, I walked in the boxing gym uh, and I thought, you know, it, it was tough. It was tough. I remember I remember my first, my first spa. I remember getting punched on the nose and crying. And I thought, this is hard. I thought, but I thought I'm coming back, so I went back, and then I just got the bug from it there on. Yeah, what do you think it was that made you go back? Because a lot of people get, you know, the Mike Tyson quote: "Everyone's got a plan to get punched in the face." People react differently to that, don't they? I, do you know what it is? I think it was just it was it was an escape away from normal life, hmm. and it was it was a bubble. And I found that now when I've retired, that it was it was a bubble. Yeah. Now I've come out of that bubble into this big world because boxers. The problem with boxers is after their career is over. What does a boxer do? If that's all you know and that's all you've ever done, I weren't educated. We'll get on to that in a minute about my education because I yeah. learned my education. 
but I weren't educated. I weren't, I weren't, you know, I weren't nothing. So basically, what do you do? I'm a bit lucky than other, other people because I've got a bit of savvy about me as well. Yeah. So, but a lot of fighters, you know, they've got nothing at the end of it. There's no pensions. There's nothing for them to move into. And that's what I think boxing needs. Yeah. You know? What What do you think it needs then? What would you advise people who might be in the sport of boxing who might not have anything after the career? Well, well, youngsters as they are now, I think invest in something while, you, while you're young, you know, and try and get an, a business on the side because boxing don't last forever. I, I was blessed. I was the oldest British fighter in the UK. Um, I was blessed. My career lasted till I was 40. So most fighters are finished by 26, mm. 27 years old. Yeah. What, 58 yeah. fighters, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Never on the floor. Yeah. Wow, really? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. Tony said the same thing. Tony Jeffrey said the same thing about investing in property. That was every time he every time he won a fight or had a fight, yeah. he was um putting half of it into a deposit for a property. Yeah. Yeah, to look after himself at the end. But yeah, I think pe it, people can take that away in normal life as well, not just boxing. Yeah, yeah, but most definitely because when when even when you've got a job, a nine to five job and you're getting a grand a week, it don't sometimes it don't last forever. Yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden you're on five hundred pound a week. So it's yeah, I suppose it's just, you know, you learn you learn as you go on in life, you know? Yeah. Amazing, mate. So you mentioned there about your education. Yeah. So how old were you when you got into boxing? And then what was your education like from that point within, like, schools or generally in the in the education system? Well, I got, I got into, obviously, I got into boxing, I told you, when I was about six, seven. Um, I went to school till I was about 11, 12, say 13. Um, I, didn't, I didn't enjoy school at all. I, I like breaking rules and... You know, I just didn't enjoy it. All I wanted to do was fight, and um, not not fight on the street, but fight in the ring. And uh, I, I was I was bullied. But then what I used to do then was the bullies. I used to bully. Do you know what I mean? Because when I see kids getting bullied at school, then I left at maybe 12, 13 years old. Really? Um, I went to work because we never had no money, so I went to work. What were you doing? I worked in a fish fish market yeah. with um yeah with with a good man who is still sponsoring me till today. He looks really? after me. He's looked after me my whole career. What a legend! Why has he done that? Do you think? Um, he just says I'm a character. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So yeah, so he, he, yeah, he's looked at, he's looked after me right you know till now. Um, so I got into the fish market. Um, the boxing career was going well. I think I was. 21 and I really took it serious because at, at one point in the, in the amateur I didn't take it serious I took it serious I was getting ready for the ABAs and um, I got arrested I got arrested for attempted murder um, on Christmas Eve and uh, I ended up doing a year in Belmarsh um, so I went in, I went into Belmarsh that was another down in my career because my career was flying and then all of a sudden I get I get arrested. Like it was ups, downs, ups, downs. So I get arrested. Um, I'd done a year in Belmarsh. I was double cat A. Um, I had a three month trial at the old Bailey. Got found not guilty. But while while my time I was in prison, I took the positives from it. So I met Jeffrey Archer in there. Uh, looked after him a little bit. So he looked after me, learnt me how to read and write. And the no rest is history. Way. And that's how you got your education? Yeah, yeah. Wow, what sort of stuff was he teaching you? Just teaching me how to read, simple how to read, how to write. You know, I could write, but not not, not that good. Um, he was writing a book in there as we, you know, he was making money while we was we were sitting there. So he was using the positive out, there, out of it as well. So I'm in his book. He speaks about me in his book. Um, yeah, we become good friends. Because when I went to prison, I thought, right, I'm in here. Who do I want to sit there and talk to? Educate people. Or, or or burglars. I want to sit here and talk to educated people. And I never knew where my life was going at that point because I didn't know I was going to be found not guilty, which I never had nothing to do with the situation, but I was there and they knew that I knew what had happened. So, but as you do, you don't say nothing, you yeah. know? It's interesting, mate, because you just triggered me thinking there about Mike Tyson again. Yeah. Because he went to prison, didn't he? And he said that's where he changed in completely in the reading that he did in there and he, you know, become a Muslim and yeah. all that stuff. And credit to you, because I think you can go into those situations, like you said, you can gravitate towards certain different yeah, people. Yeah, crime, yeah, crime and things like that. But no, I just, I just, I met some really clever people in there, educated people. I was in there with the boys from the Millennium Dome. I was in, you know, I was in, I was in there with some serious, serious criminals as well, but serious criminals are, are very clever people. Mm. A lot of them are clever and you pick a lot of, pick a lot of their brains and you pick a lot, um, I come out of I come out of jail. Um, I, I needed some time apart away. I remember coming out and I come out and I was watching the telly. It might have been a day after or two days after. All of a sudden, planes bang into the in, into the tower. Oh, I thought, no jeez, I thought, is this a film? 
Mm. I couldn't believe it. And it, it was too much for my head. So I ended up going back to where I come from, Connemara. Um, my sister lived there. My sister moved there. So I ended up going back to Connemara, uh, spending a bit of time with her. I was there four months. I'm near on turned into an alcoholic. Um, just was drinking. I didn't know where my life was going. She said to me, go back to the UK and get back, at, you know, get back into your boxing, turn professional, do something. So I rang Frank Maloney, now known as Kelly Maloney. Uh, so yeah, I rang him and I said, I said, look, any chance of me turning pro? Went back to the UK, turned pro, and uh, started went pro and I was a big name at the start, you know. How many fights were you before prison and how many after? I didn't have. I was amateur still before prison. Oh, so you're 50, 58, you're saying, are all pro? Yeah, all pro. Wow. Yeah, I, had, I had about 100 and something amateurs. Wow. You know what I mean? But basically, when, when I went back to the UK and I turned pro, this is another story I told you, and this is for <laughs> all the young, you know, young fighters out there. Well, just people in general, you know, in life. I was free and I, I was all over the place. I was all over Time Out magazines, front pages, everything. I was a celebrity. I was, I was a superstar. I was this, I was that. All of a sudden, my full fight, I end up losing. I must have walked into the all-call with 600 fans. I walked out of the all-call with my rucksack on my own. And that's the truth. Always remember that while you're up there, everyone's there. When you're down there, everyone's gone. How did you deal with that? Well, I had to just bounce back again, didn't I? So uh, just gritted my teeth. Um, just uh, started back training. Um, Went a little bit on up and down career, like up and down the road. Like I was taking fights at no notice, taking fights at two hours, three hours notice, pro fights. Um, but I just thought I'm going to keep fighting. I want to become a champion. I know I'm going to become a champion. I was born to be a champion. Mm. And um, end up meeting uh, me now fiance. Um, got me head a little bit more straighter because I was a little, I was wild. I was wild when I was young, you know, and uh, met me fiance. Uh, become a little bit more straighter. Um, yeah, and, and and we we was pregnant with she. Well, we weren't. She was pregnant <laughs> with, with our first child, Shannon. Um, I was fighting Michael Gomez, and uh, I was. I rem remember it. I was twelve weeks out, and I was sitting in a McDonald's in Epsom. Phone rings. It's Frank Moran. We got a show tonight. Are you all cool? Uh, the Sky are gonna pull it unless we can get one more fight. Do you fancy fighting? I had a Big Mac in my mouth, yeah? God. Three hours from, from the, it must have been three o'clock in the afternoon. I think I was on at seven. I said, don't worry, Frank, I'll be there. I didn't even ask how much money. That's me. I'm a, I was just a natural fighter. I wanted to fight. Straight down there. Now, I was in contract with uh, Gomez. I was fighting him in Ireland. So I goes down there, has the fight, wins it, comes back, wins the promoter. If I want to run it, I've got to run the promoter, run the promoter. I said, listen, I had a fight tonight. He goes, I know, I'll see you on the sky. Sports. So I said, look, didn't even tell uh, Candice, my fiance. I just, I just went down there, come back. I had the dough in my hand, give her the dough. I said, look, I've just had a fight tonight. That's amazing. She was, she was, preg she was pregnant. Anyways, so I goes to Ireland for, uh, for the press conference eight weeks before the fight. I was 125 to one to beat Michael Gomez because I was my career was up and down at the time, yeah. as they say, journeyman. But like I say, I've never took a fight believing that I'm going to lose. I always thought I was going to win. Never once did I take one in 58 fights think I was going to lose. I always didn't let a win. Anyways, so I took the, I, so I goes to, uh, I was at the airport, all of a sudden, Yuri Geller's at the airport. So I goes up to Yuri Geller, I said, listen, can you give me a bit of luck for my fight? He said, you don't need it. You're going to win. As soon as he said that in my head, that was it. it, it it's all the power of the mind. Flew back to, he, he said, take my number, when you come back, work with me for a little while, and then we'll, get, we, we'll, um, we'll do a bit of work, and uh, I'll come out to the fight with you. I thought, Jesus. Goes out to the press conference, has the press conference, has a little roll about the press conference, comes back. Um, so what was it? Three weeks before the fight, I'm, now I'm doing a bit of mind work with Yuri Geller. All positive thinking. So I'm doing, I'm really believing that sort of stuff. And all the top athletes, every one of them, Tiger Woods has been using one probably 15 years ago before anyone used one. I, I really believe in that sort of stuff. Three weeks before the fight, um, gets a bit of bad news. My missus gets uh, brought into hospital. We thought she had melanoma. She was three weeks away from giving birth to my little girl. She ended up having an operation, having a mole cut out of her leg. I still had to stay on track. I had a job to do. So I kept my mind strong and I just thought to myself, I've got to stay strong. I thought, no way is Michael Gomez beating me. What I'm going through here, I'm, there's no 
there's no way in this world he's beating me. She comes out of hospital. Now I've got to worry on my head thinking, you know, is it bad? Is it this? Is it that? So anyway, goes back to Ireland. No, no. So Yuri Geller rings me up on a Tuesday. He says, uh, go to Farnborough Airport, private airport. We're flying back on a private jet. And he said, you're going to be treated like David Beckham. Honestly, it was, it was, it was amazing. So there was a man in Ireland called Patrick Rocker. And he, he give, give us the plane. He had rocker tiles. I don't know if you've seen rocker, rocker. You see rocker on toilets and all that. It's like on the toilet oh, yeah. seat. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. anyway, that was a, probably the richest family in Ireland. So flew back on a private jet, went to the fight, done the job. Unbelievable. Win the Irish title on the front of every newspaper. For what reasons? Not for the right reasons. On the front of this is a fix. It was a scandal. It was this, it was that. And I said, look, look at the man. Do I look like I'm, I've been in a fixed fight? Do I? So it was from being up there to back down there again. Mm. But Yuri Geller said to me, don't worry. He said, any publicity is good publicity. Yeah. Which we took, which we took. Stayed in Ireland for a little while, come back. Ended up getting the news what we needed. It weren't melanoma she had. It was just a funny mole she had. So, but I still had that on my mind when we come back to the UK. So I said to, I said to Yuri Geller, let me give uh, Patrick Rocker. Uh, let me give Patrick Rocker a ring and say thank you for giving us the private jet. He goes, you won't get nowhere near Patrick Rocker. I said, just give me his number and let me try and speak to him. Week later, where would you think I was? I flew back out to Ireland. I was with Patrick Rocker, <laughs> Sit, sitting in a, sitting in a restaurant, having something to eat. All of a sudden, he was sitting there talking. And he said, "Ah, oh, yeah." I said, uh, "He said I got going forty five minutes. Hour and a half had gone past. He was enjoying my company." So we're sitting there. He goes, "Oh, Van will be in a minute. Van will be in a minute." I thought, "Who's he on about, Van?" And I thought, and he, he said to me, oh, uh, uh, well, uh, this is Van, this is Peter, blah, blah, blah. Who do you think walked in? Van Morrison. He was with really? Misha, he was with Misha Rocker, who was Patrick's yeah. sister. Yeah, yeah. So I was flying with Patrick. He sponsored me, done this, done that. Six months later, maybe a year later, what happened? The Celtic Tiger went down. He blew his brains out. So I lost, I lost, I lost him as a sponsor. <laughs> but yeah, so... Um, yeah, so that was that was that story that, mate, about the Michael Gomez. Yeah, so, there's so yeah. much to dissect there, mate. I mean, even yeah. just to, to begin with, you, you mentioned the fight that you lost and you walked out with a backpack on. Yeah. It's interesting, Isaac said a similar story about his fight with Akoli that everyone was there buzzing yeah. off him, loving him, and then as soon as he lost that he looked around and even, you know, even his family members weren't there to support him. Yeah. So I think that's something that obviously strengthens you as a character. Yeah. And then something that I was really interested to talk to you about, obviously this is a, a peak performance podcast. So we talk about practices that can help us reach higher levels of performance. Yeah. Like I've just actually come from uh, one of the float tanks. I don't know if you've seen these float tanks, the sensory deprivation tanks at all. Yeah, they're basically, uh, they've got one in uh, third space, haven't they? In Piccadilly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I used to use it. I used to okay, use it. nice. See, I'm, I'm forward with all that sort of there stuff. There you go, I, yeah. I, I used, I used uh, altitude chambers. Yeah. I, see, I what I had was what everyone else, a lot of people, other people didn't have. I was always forward in certain things. So who I'd got out, you into the altitude chamber? Um, David A. Really? Because we both trained with Adam Booth at, um, ah. uh, at Third Space. So what, you had it at a reduced oxygen level, right? Yeah, the oxygen, I think it was, oh, what was it? So many feet above ground. You yeah. know what I mean, I mean yeah, I've yeah. been out to Andorra. I mean, I'm good friends with Bradley Smith. You know, the uh, MotoGP rider. Yeah. I'm good friends with him, Leon nice. Camiar. And they both live in Andorra. And they're right up in the uh, mountains. So you do the altitude training? Yeah, do the altitude sort of training. And Did you notice the difference? Yeah, big, mm. big. Some people it don't work for, but I noticed it, I noticed it big. I mean, yeah. we'll get onto it in a minute about my bad, but I found the same with my bad. Do you know okay. What I mean? Yeah, interesting. Well, we like, I, I actually did my, uh, when I studied at uni, I did my dissertation on altitude training. Yeah. Um, up at Leeds there, the altitude yeah. chamber there. So I was training in there as well, like yeah. with the reduced oxygen saturation. Yeah. But yeah, so I've just done a float there. So I'm f- feeling pretty good today. But this is one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about. You mentioned Yuri Geller. Obviously, yeah. it's quite an out there thing to to incorporate into your training practice. Yeah. But I'm such a big believer on positivity and yeah. mindset as well. Yeah. You said it had a big impact. What was specifically the kind of things he was he was saying to you? What the kind of methods or practices you go through with him? See, listen, your mind's, your mind's a funny thing. I mean... I use one, of the t- listen, t- today, I use one of the top people in Arley Street. He's at number one Arley Street. His name's Rory Jackson, right? Isaac uses him as well. Okay, for right? what? For mind work. Okay. Right? He, he looks after, well, I can't even mention people. He looks he looks after big people. And yeah. they, obviously, it's all uh, confidential. He looks after, he don't look after. What's his name? Uh, uh, Rory McLaren. Rory McLaren, okay. Rory McLaren, he, he's top He's top notch. Yeah. He's, um. I mean, maybe it might even be worth getting him. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be able to set the connection okay. up for you. Amazing. 
But basically, um, yeah, what it is, your mind, right? If you wake up in the morning and you feel bad, yeah, you're going to feel bad all day. If you wake up in the morning and you change your mind on how you're feeling, it, it, it changes everything. And basically, when Yuri Geller said, when Yuri Geller said what he said to me, like when he just said, you're going to win, forget all the rest of what he done with me. When he said, you're going to win, you don't need it, right? That was it. I've won. I knew I'd won in my mind. Change of perception. Change, change of perception. You know, yeah. even even walking out of the changing room, I remember there was me here, Gomez there, Billy Graham there, Hatton, Matthew Macklin, everyone. He had, he had a whole team behind him. I said, I don't care who's behind you. I am going to smash you to pieces. <laughs> yeah, because my mind was, when your mind's right, that's all that matters, which which my mind was right for the last six six years of my career. I never lost in the last six years of my career because everything was right. Everything was right. I got it right. What else do you think it was? Your mind, what else? Um, no, just uh, your mind. Listen, your mind's 90% of it. All that rubbish <laughs> about training like a lunatic. Let me tell you something about training like a lunatic. When you're training like a lunatic, you're either going to overtrain, right? Anthony Joshua, for example, right? Look at the body on the man, right? I've always had a pot belly, right? I've never been dropped in my life, right? I've always been relaxed when I've got in there because it's all in there. It's all up there. Forget about that. See that? You'll be talking to lampposts. If you, if you, the heart, you'll be talking to lampposts. Yeah. Use your head and you'll stay clever. Hmm. And, and, and I really, I really believe it's all about the mind. I believe 90% of it, 10% of it's physical. So how, how do you think? Cause like you've obviously, you've explained some of the hardships you've been through. Do you think it was going through those experiences that made you stronger and give you the ability to flip your mindset? Or, or is there something else you've done like practices that have allowed you to get a stronger, more tougher mindset? No, I just, I, I just always think about the people that are worse off in the world than what we are. Mm. You know, it, you know, you're walking around a shop, you know, and, and there's someone in a wheelchair. You're lucky to be walking. Yeah. You know, exercise. Exercise is the one. See, antidepressants. Doctors should start giving out gym memberships, right? Mm -hmm. Stop giving people antidepressants. Antidepressants ain't doing them no good. Give them gym memberships, right? That will sort them out. Do you know what I mean? That will help you. And and, and that is definitely a natural antidepressant yeah. for gym. I couldn't agree more, mate. That's yeah. definitely my medicine, mate. Yeah. I have to do it every day. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've... Obviously, what I've had now happen to me, I've had a bit of time out of the gym. And listen, my mind's gone here, there and everywhere. With that in mind, mate, you yeah. just mentioned what's happened to you. So it's obviously still quite raw, isn't it? In January, you yeah. had a diagnosis. Yeah. Are you happy to talk to us? To yeah, yeah, yeah. Happened? But I, before we get to that point, we, haven't we got a little bit of time yet, haven't we? Yeah, we, before, can, we can bounce around. Yeah, before we get... Uh, yeah, yeah, whatever you want. No, but I just... Uh, yeah, don't... Yeah, that's not... I just want to put in... Con, like, put in... Uh, Feel, yeah, line, whatever yeah, you want to do yeah. to set it up context-wise. Yeah, now, ba now basically, so like I say, when when I moved from Ireland, my sister said to me, go back to the UK and go back boxing, obviously because my career was, you know, I was just drinking and, you know, which young kids do, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And uh, she'd go back and go back to your career. And then I got the bad news about my sister. Um, my sister was like my mum. She brought us up. She brought all four of us up. So she never really had a childhood. And uh, then my sister got diagnosed with cancer. Breast cancer, and uh, so how long ago was this? That was six years ago. Okay, um, and then obviously she died within eight months. Um, and when I was lying on a pillar on her bed in the hospice, I turned around and said to her, "I'm going to win titles for you, Tish. I promise you. You've given me the strength now, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep winning." And I said, as "Soon as I lose, I'm retiring." And obviously, uh, she gave me the strength. Six, eight weeks later, I won a title for her on Channel 5. So, um, yeah, she, you know, and never lost since. How did that feel? Yeah, it felt great. It felt great. Uh, obviously, I went back and put it straight on a grave in Ireland. <laughs> um, but while, while my sister, because what you got to do in life is, not everyone's the same, but what I find is to reach out to other people to give you strength and... What had happened was in the November, I went out, no, October, I went out to Marbella, hmm. uh, MGM Marbella. And uh, I was I was doing a bit of sparring out there with Bradley Saunders and Bradley Saunders beat me. And uh, anyways, Daniel was out there, the man who, who used to have the gym and that. And uh, he turned around and said to me, well, well, you know, you're doing well with sparring. You're a good fighter. You know, well, what's going on? And I said, look, I just ain't been looked after. I've, I said, I've been all over the place. I'd fight anyone, I'd do anything. And he said, would you would you want a chance to be looked after? And I said, I don't know, my sister's not well at the moment and all that. So I said, let me go back to the UK and think about it and all that. But all the time I was speaking to him, 
well, what my sister was going through. And I think that's a big thing what, you, what you, people should do, you know, speak to people because you've got to let it out. So I, I was speaking to him all the time and I said, uh, and, and, he's, and then I lost my sister and he said, come out and, and see us and just see what you want to do. So I went out and see him. I said, look, I don't even think I want to fight again. I think that's it. And he said, but you, you promised your sister that you was going to fight again and win the title for her. So he said, let us look after you. And, you know, so I goes, all right, I'll give it one more go. I, I shook his hand and I said, but as soon as I lose, I'm retiring. And he said, all right then, shook his hand and still shaking hands now because <laughs> I, I ain't lost, you know. So. How, do you think that, like, how do you think that people can better cope with death or mortality? It's something that's quite difficult, I think, especially in... The UK, it's interesting. I was, I was having a chat with a friend of mine who's Irish literally yesterday about this, yeah. how the, the British stiff upper lip, you know, people don't often open up and talk about these things. Yeah. But in, in Ireland, it's celebrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very soon after the death, yeah, usually yeah. two, three days tops, there's a celebration yeah. and it can turn into, although, yeah, it's, it's sad, it can turn into a celebration or a positive. Yeah, yeah. I positive mean, I, I dug my sister's grave. I dug my sister's grave because that's how you do it in Ireland. It's personal. Wow. So you basically dig, dig the grave and then... You bury, you bury the body. Yeah, you celebrate, you celebrate their life. You know, as, as sad as it is, the problem is, in anything in life you go into, you've got to go into it smiling because you never know whether you're going to be here tomorrow. And we'll get onto that point in a minute as well because it's, it, it, my surgeons could not believe the way I acted when when I went into have my operation, which was life threatening. You know. So, do you want to talk to us about the diagnosis in January? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so I had. So basically, I was at the darts with uh, Chris Mason and John Rawlins. Or oh, Ali Pali? No, we was at, um, I had to be further away, Milton Keynes. I was in Milton <laughs> Keynes and I was with Tony Discipline, uh, as it goes. And um, basically, I was, at the, I was at the darts and uh, I had a few Guinnesses, as you do. It's, f it's very funny because I was on the band. No, I weren't on the band. I got banned for drinking Guinness, didn't I, at the weigh-in. I got an eight-month ban. Canelo got a six-month ban for steroids. So how did you bite that one out? But so was that again, to do with the the like the the um the push and the yeah? But what what no? I'm not mentioning no names. What about people throwing tables up in the air and all that and getting nothing? Yeah. So yeah. you know, I was I was badly treated, right? Yeah. But basically, you could argue that about like people like Dylan White and stuff now, can you? Well, they've they've got evidence, don't they? So <laughs> let's, let's just see. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so ho hopefully not. Hopefully Dylan Dylan's done well. Hopefully you know he comes through it, and you know what I mean. But um. Yeah, so basically, I got done for drinking a Guinness. Anyways, I was drinking Guinness in. Uh, it wasn't a Guinness anyway. It was like a sports drink, yeah. but it was just a, it was just a gimmick. You know what I mean? Tyson Fury laughing his head off about it. So I was at the darts, and um, I was with Chris and uh, John and Tony, and I collapsed. So Tony picked me up off the floor, and he started laughing, and he said, "God, you've had a lot to drink, haven't you?" But he let go of me again, and bang, I've gone over again. Do you remember this happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Bang, I've gone over again. So he's picked me up and he's got me and, he, and I said, Tone, I don't feel right. I said, I think I've been spiked. I think something's been putting me drink. So he got his, he put his arm around me, like he got my arm around him and he sort of brought me to the hotel. But the hotel was about, say, I don't know, 500 metres from the, because it's in Milton Keynes in the uh, stadium. So it was the Hilton yeah. right on it. Yeah. So he brought me to the, uh, um, to the hotel. So I got into the bed. I got sick a couple of times. He goes, go to bed, go to sleep. You'll be all right in the morning, right? So I just went, I went to sleep. I got sick a couple more times. So I got up in the morning, walked around to the toilet. As I've come back, I've collapsed again. I said, Tony, mate, I don't feel right. He said, all right, let me just get Nick, one of, one of our friends. So Nick came out. He said, listen, just have a can of Coke. You'll be all right, right? So I tried a can of Coke and I did feel better. I felt a bit, little bit better. I thought it was like dehydration. Yeah. So I said, boys, I'm driving home. So I drove to the first services by Luton. Got out. Got out. I thought, God, I've still been drinking. Like, I'm still drunk from last night. I better go and get a coffee or something. So as I've gone walking into the coffee place, I've collapsed again. I've nearly been run over. Got into the coffee place, got sick, sat down. As I've sat down, I'm sitting there for about an hour and I'm trying to be honest as I'm a fighter and I'm sitting there like, and I thought, I'm going to get nicked. I'm going to get nicked because I'm drink driving. And I said, ring me an ambulance. I said, I don't feel right. So they rung me an ambulance. Who did? The people in the service? Yeah, station? in services, yeah. Brought me, brought me to the, um, brought me to the uh, hospital. But basically the ambulance like put all these uh, ECGs on me, blood tests and everything in the ambulance. And they was going, no, nah, everything's all right. And I thought, God, mate, what's happening here? Am I like faking, like not faking it, but I felt like I was. So all of a sudden they brought me in the ambulance place and I, and I was having a whisper, but in my head I was thinking, they don't think this is serious. So they moved me to action emergency. I was out in action emergency for about six hours, brought me in, done a CT scan on me, done blood tests on me. And they said, oh, we can't, we can't really find nothing. Give me this green injection to stop the dizziness. 
So they said, you might have had a mild stroke. So I said, listen, I want to go home. I don't want to be here. I said, can I drive? They said, yeah. So I drove home. So it wasn't picked up in the scan? In a CT scan, it right. wasn't picked up. Okay. So the next day, I goes to the doctors. They get me an electro right. to the doctors. And they got me walking on the spot. And when I was walking on the spot, the uh, doctor was in front of me. All of a sudden, I'd done a free, well, not 360, a 180. And I was like facing the other way. And I said, if you just come around the back of me. And honestly, I didn't feel like I'd moved. So said, listen, we better get you to the hospital. Blah, blah, blah. They sent me to a stroke unit at um, Epsom Hospital. Goes to the stroke unit. And they goes, right, we're going to send you for an MRI scan. I said, I have MRI scans every year. They said, we're going to send you for an MRI scan. So I goes down for the MRI scan. Comes back up and he, and he goes, congratulations, you ain't had a stroke. They said, but you've got a tumour. I said, oh, yeah, that's a result. <laughs> but he said, no, the difference is it looks to us as though it's a benign uh, acoustic neuroma. So... He said, if it's a stroke, you never know when you're going to get another one. He said, but at least with this, we can just get it out. So they tried to get me an emergency operation uh, for St. George's, St. George's Hospital. So they put me into a bed and they left me there for about four hours. And I said, listen, I said, if you ain't giving me no tablets or giving me anything, I'm, I said, I'm going home because I'd rather sleep in my own bed tonight if I can't get. So St. George's said, send him home. Uh, we'll see him next week. So I went up to St. George's the week after. Obviously, my head was all over the place. Went up to St. George's the week after. What was that week like in between, just like waiting? Yeah, week in between waiting. So I went up to St. George's. Yeah, no, I just I just try to stay positive, you yeah. know what I mean? I just done my bits and pieces and, you know, focusing and reading books and, you know what I mean, just positive stuff. Mm. So basically, I'll tell you exactly what I've done. Forget all that positive business. I sat there and watched YouTube for a week on the operation, what they're going to do to me, what Did I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose my hearing in one ear. I'm going to lose my balance in one side. You know, they're going to leave a little bit of the tumour, which is on your uh, on your facial nerves because your don't, face don't drop. So I goes in there. So they said to me, oh, uh, we're going to do it in three months' time. I said, listen, I'm going private with it. I ain't waiting three months. So they said to me, they said to me, it don't matter. We're still going to be doing the operation in three months. What does it matter waiting three months? We'd rather you just get fit again and do a bit of training. So I said, listen, if one comes in Monday morning, can I can I get straight in? He said, yeah, it, 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 no, no. So if the one comes in Monday morning, they said, no, look, you're going to have to wait three months. I said, listen, I know what happens. My ear's going to be, I'm going to have no ear in. I'm going to have this, I'm going to have that. He said, how do you know all this? I said, I've watched the operation. I said, I'm not going to let you do an operation on me without me knowing what you're going to do. So he started laughing at me. He said, you're the most positive man that's ever come in here. So I ended up leaving. Get started to do a little bit of training. Gets a phone call. Week later, bang, straight in for the operation. Um... Got my mind right for the operation again. They turned around and said, I'm going to do in day in intensive care and I'm going to have seven days in hospital. I went in on the Monday uh, to have the operation on a Tuesday. On the Sunday, it's my sister's birthday, St. Patrick's Day. Oh. I said, I'm going home on a Sunday. They said, you're not. There's no way you're going home on Sunday. I said, I'm going home on Sunday. So eight hour operation, one day in intensive care, about seven days in hospital. So anyways, goes down for the operation, comes out the operation, operation 15 hours. Yeah, two days in intensive care, 11 days in hospital. Three hours in intensive care, I pulled all the leads out myself, got out of bed and said, I'm going home. They moved me onto a ward. They said they couldn't believe it, moved me onto a ward. 10 hours later, I was walking around the ward. The, the surgeons could not believe it. And when did I go home? St. Patrick's Day. It's his birthday. Yeah, because oh, it was in my mind. I, I was going home and that was it. They said, we've never seen it happen before. We've never ever seen someone do what you've just done. But I said, I'm telling you, I knew in my mind I was going home. So powerful, mate. Thanks yeah. for sharing, by the way, mate. It's yeah. something that speaks to me really personally as well. Like I mentioned to you just before we started recording that my mum went through a similar experience, but yeah. it was more... Malignant, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it was like um, she was having dizzy spells and then she wouldn't be able to speak. And uh, there was one really like scary moment when she'd actually picked me and my girlfriend up from the airport. Yeah. She was driving back on the motorway. Yeah. And it, one of these episodes happened and I had to like grab the wheel yeah. and pull it into the hard shoulder. Like, yeah, pretty pretty terrifying. And eventually, a few months later, they kept saying, oh, you're just having migraines, all this sort of stuff, misdiagnosis. Yeah. And then uh, eventually collapsed and was rushed to um, John Moore's, which is like a specialist brain yeah. hospital. That's um, uh, Liverpool, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, not John Moore's. Uh, the one in Oxford. Um, uh, Radcliffe. John Radcliffe. Radcliffe yeah, yeah. yeah. I know that because um, I'm a patron of a charity and... Uh, Neve died in there, a little girl that had neuroblastoma. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, but really, they're a really great hospital, though. Yeah, brilliant, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you, puts a lot of money into that. Um, Richard Branson. Richard Does Branson he? puts loads into oh, that. Oh, yeah. amazing. Yeah. But she had, a thank, thankfully, a really successful operation there. 
Yeah. But it's interesting you talk about the positivity. She was very similar in her mindset and yeah. now even looks at it as like the best thing that's ever happened to her. Yeah, it, it, it does. It, it makes you uh, reevaluate life. And um, one of the biggest things it done with me was um, realise that how strong I really am. And, and the type of people that I had around me, you know, I was getting uh, messages off Alan Carr, messages off Rudimental, messages off Tyson Fury, messages off... Uh, Sam Bailey I was getting messages of every all different sports all different you know singers everything and it's it's nice to know that people you know are out there for you yeah. and and um, like I say I come, when I, one, once I come out of hospital um, I went and picked my little girl up four days later from school uh, with Candice and as we walk into the school we see one of Candice's friends because my other little girl Shannon's an actor and um, she, we met one of her friend's mums and now uh, she turned around and said, oh, how's it going all that? I said, yeah, I'm coming through it, you know, blah, blah, blah. They couldn't believe that I was walking, like, you know, doing what I was doing, you know, four days later. And uh, I said, look, the worst, you know, I'm going to do a documentary on my life. I said, you know, I've had a crazy life mm -hmm. and it will be a great documentary because what I want to do is, it ain't about making money. It's about just sharing with people that when you have bad times, there's always good times around the corner. Yeah. And I said, the worst thing that can happen now is death. Gets in the car, phone rings, it's my brother's girlfriend, she's crying her eyes out. Your brother's committed suicide. Four days after. So uh, my brother rung himself four days after uh, I come out of hospital. So, and he was suffering with depression. I didn't even know he was suffering with depression. Had you spoke to him after you came out of hospital? On the phone no, no, phone? no. He texted me just before I was going into hospital and said, uh, it texted my missus, we're a funny family. Although uh, my dad brought four of us up, we we're all quite... They call us the fight in McDonald's because we, we none of us all spoke at the same time. Do you know what I mean? It was like tough love. We're just <laughs> tough love people. And uh, yeah, so, and then I find out that, and that night when I found out, drove straight down to the house. I drove to the house when he was supposed to be driving. Drove to the house and uh, where he hung himself. I just had to go there. Not that anything was there or whatever, but I just had to go there. And then three weeks later, I was carrying his coffin. So Mate, if it's all right with you, I'd love to talk a little bit more about your brother and the, the depression yeah. and stuff a bit later on, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just to come back into like some of the stuff that you suffered with directly. Yeah. Do you think it changed you in any way, having the brain tumour and having the operation? Because it's, it's such a scary thing to think about. The brain is such like, a massive unknown, isn't it? When I signed the forms, because going back to that anyway, the brain tumour, when, when I went to, when I was going down to have, to have it, obviously, listen, you sign forms till you, get, you die. You know that people, you know, you don't know who anyone is. But as I signed them from, said, listen, the only thing that I don't want to happen to me, I don't care if I die. But I said, the only thing I don't want to do is wake up and not know who no one is. I said, can I sign a form now and say, like, bring me to Switzerland and uh, put an injection? <laughs> yeah. But my mate Rory, who I told you to mind, man, said, listen, we've already done our own work and it's a lot of money to send you to Switzerland. So he said, listen, we put two bricks on your legs and we chuck you in a nice part of the Thames by Chelsea or something. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he made it. He made it still a laugh, you know. He made it. He made it still fun. But uh, so obviously, I got dressed up in all my gear, put my uh, whole leprechaun outfit on, uh, and walked down to have me have me surgery. No and way, as, in a leprechaun uh, outfit. I got it. It's all. It, it's all going to be well. Hopefully, we got a Netflix thing with with me uh, surgery. What, what's it going to be called? Uh, we don't know yet. We okay. ain't got. We ain't got a, a proper name yet. So we're just waiting. Might just be the Kanamara kid. But uh, yeah, and as I was walking down, even the surgeons looked at me, shook their heads, and I thought, "What? Um, what am I doing? Because they're going to play about my brain, so they probably think he's mad anyway." <laughs> no we, we mess it up. But uh, as they took as they took the outfit off me, they said to me, uh, "I said, listen, I want a hat coming in the room with me." Obviously, I've still got the hat, and they, everywhere I went, they brought the hat. So the whole hospital in St George's knew who I was. Like oh, I was amazing. When they went to knock me out, this is no joke. So they give me the gas in there. And as they done that, they give me the injection. And they said, count to ten, count to ten downwards, and you'll be asleep by the time you go down. So I went nine, eight, seven, six, five. Got to thirty. They could not believe it. Got to thirty. That's keep giving you more. Yeah, keep them. more. Yeah. Couldn't believe it because I was still talking to them. <laughs> and all of a sudden, then, and it was so surreal because obviously it was a fifteen hour up. But basically, as I was coming out, I woke up in the theater just as it was finishing. I woke up in the theater. It was crazy. You know? Mate, it's, it's amazing because you're speaking so eloquently about it, first of all, but yeah. so openly about it. And yeah. bear in mind, it's only happened in March. Yeah. So could you look back at it now, even though it's so raw and it's only just recently happened, and see any positives that have come from it? Yeah, the, posit yeah, the positives that have come from it is that I didn't take a shot in the ring and die, you know, because uh, I must have had it before then, do you know what I mean? Mm. Still investigating at the moment what's going on, but uh, yeah, it just... 
it's, it's a blessing. Listen, at the end of the day, the way you got to look at it is, I looked at it like this straight away again. I'm in a ward. My wife come up to see me and she said to me, how come they ain't coming in to see you so quick? I said, because see all these people here, they're all dying. They're all going to be dead within two, three weeks. I said, because they've got, they've got malignant, they've got like cancer in the, in the brain. I said, how blessed am I not to have cancer? That's the way, see, that's the way I've just looked at it. You know, that I'm, I'm here to tell the story. I'm here to, you know, to tell people. But I went up there the other day for um, a checkup and uh, the doctor said, a surgeon said to me, he said to me, you're so positive you are, like you blah, blah, this and that. And, he, and I said, yeah, I said, it's only a little scratch. What's the matter with you? You know what I mean? It's done now and I'm, I'm, I'm getting better and this and that. He said, listen, there's three people out there in wheelchairs who exactly the same thing as you. You're very lucky. Do you know what I mean? And, I, and, I, and I sort of, it took me back a little bit. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think there's probably an element of like physical strength. You're, you're an athlete. I know, you, yeah. I know you, I've heard you say you're not an athlete, you're a boxer. Yeah. But you were athletic, very fit. Yeah. So that probably helped as well. Yeah, I, I tried, listen, like I say, we're going back to that, uh, you know, the, you know, health, mental health and things like that. I never knew how much training helped me, mm. boxing helped me, yeah, fitness in general, just gym. Forget the boxing, gym gym in general. Because now I've been out of the gym, well, I'm back in the gym, I've just started back in the gym, but now I have been was out of the gym, I was depressed. I was, you know what I mean? I was sitting there in my underpants eating packets of crisps. Do you know what I mean? And and, and thinking like, oh, where's my next opportunity going to come? Yeah. Your next opportunity is never going to come because no one's going to knock at your door. You know what I mean? No one's going to bust your door down and say, listen, come here and do this. You've got to go out and get it yourself. But the first steps you take is going to a gym or going for a walk. You don't even have to go to a gym. Let's forget that because people say, oh, no, it costs money. Go for a walk. Go for a run. Go for a cycle. You know, and that's what I want to put across to people now, especially with losing my brother, the mental wealth side of things that, you know, when you're stuck indoors and you're cooped up, your mind does funny things, you know. Your mind, listen, your mind can be the strongest thing and your mind can be the weakest thing. And with boxers, people think boxers got strong minds. Forget that, they ain't. Their minds are quite weak, to be honest with you. Do you know what I mean? We've, really? Yeah, yeah, they're quite weak. They're not as strong as what you think. Why is you know that? I mean? Listen, at the end of the day, people go, you're going to have a fight. It's a war. It's, it's, it's not a war. A war is when you're on, on, on the front line, mate, getting bullets thrown at you. You, you know what I mean? you got a referee in the middle of you in the middle of a ring. Do you know what I mean? So, but we're very, very weak with certain things because you're so one-dimensional in what you're doing. Do you know what I mean? So people can off-track you quick, mm. you know? Yeah. What do you think? It, what do you think it was with your brother then that led to the to the depression? Was, do you think it was that isolation? He didn't talk. He didn't talk. You know, you got me that don't stop talking. <laughs> you know, honestly, you know, my, my other brothers brothers the same. He's quite quiet, and but I'm out there. You know what I mean? If I don't feel well today, I'll tell you I don't feel well yeah. today. If if that's that's my way of showing it, and I think that's what people do. I know people are different, but people hide a lot of it inside. All this about doing is talking, and especially men, because men think they've got to be tough and they've got to be strong. I, mean, I can fight like anything and yeah. never went over in my life. And, you know, people said I was the toughest man in the world. But listen, when it comes to talking about things, it's a lot harder yeah. than, than showing your macho side. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, so I just like to let everything go. You know what I mean? So basically, you've in your brain, right? So your mind, you've basically, your room's all messy. Yeah. So you've got to start there and your room's all messy in your brain. So you think, right, I put that pair of trousers there, I put that there. And all of a sudden you start tidying your brain up. And once your brain's tidy, it clears your head, you know, because that's what happens. It's like your head's messed up and it? it's messy. So you've got to just try and clear things or get things out of your head. Yeah. And would you say that all these like stuff you've spoken about, the, the obstacles, the challenges you've come through and, and been better for, are they the things that are messy in your head? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like my, career, my career, I mean, how can a man at his peak... Right, I might have had me peak late, but as a young, it's like losing, winning, losing, winning, losing, winning, losing, 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 winning. But and then the last what, thirty six to forty one, or thirty five, I'm beaten. Yeah, it's crazy because yeah. I got my mind right and I got my mind clear and I know what I wanted. It's all about finding out what you want in life, yeah. what you want out of life. Now, that's that journey over. Now I'm going to get into acting. Nice, mate. You know, nice. One more thing I want to ask you about your brother. You seem to attract so much positivity around you. You know, people sending you all these messages, the different people that are coming to your life at the right time. If you could go back a few months' time before your brother decided to take his life, what would you say to him? Um, do you know what? It's crazy because I was laying on the operating table taking every breath I could to live, to live for life, Yeah. And he was doing the total opposite, putting something around his neck to suffocate himself and lose his life. 
it's hard sometimes because I sit there and think, if I would have died on that operating table, would my brother still be here? Do you know what I mean? So it's hard to say. What 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 could you say? What could you know? What can you say? It's it's, it's tough. Do you know what I mean? It, it's it's. But you know what? Even at his funeral, like it's mad. But I didn't cry because he obviously didn't want to be here. He always said he wanted to be with my sister. Did and he, he? yeah, he was he was the se like he was they was close. They was only a year apart. And he always said he, so that probably was a sign. You know what I mean? But you don't take them signs, do you? Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. I want to be here as long as I can because we never know what's around the clock. Like, we never know if there's this or that afterlife. And do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I said, you know, if you go to if you go to hell, like if they say there's a hell, you know, it could be exciting down there. But I'll always know someone in heaven I can get in the back door. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right, mate. So if you have to pick one, for the whole, all of the stuff you've been through, your boxing career, like your whole life, you have to pick one highlight, something that really sticks out in your mind as one of the best times that you've experienced, one of the, one of the most happiest times that you've been, what would you what would you say? Kids being born. Okay, nice. Yeah. How many kids have you got? I've got two. Have you? Two, yeah. I've got Shannon, who's 13. She's a little actress. And I've got Marnie, who's nine. She's a little cheerleader. Um, yeah, yeah. Listen, and my dad's still around. My dad's 80 in September. So. Do you see him a lot? Yeah, I do. He lives in Bermondsey, so he's only across from here. Yeah. So he's not far. He won't move out of Bermondsey. It's crazy. Like, I live in the country now where I was in Connemara, around the middle of nowhere. Now I'm out back where, near on where I was. And uh, he just loves it. He loves the city life. And, you know. So. Do you think there's something to be said for that, though? Like, you said you, you, you grew up or your very early years, right, in the country, yeah. in Ireland. And then you come into the city. And then do you feel almost more at home back out in the country again? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, even when I go to Ireland, every time I go to Ireland, it feels like home. Yeah. It feels like home, you know, because I was born there. It's funny because I was born there and all my sister, my two brothers were born in the UK. It's crazy. And uh, yeah, I just, it, it, that, feels like, that feels like home. So now when I'm out in the country, it's good upbringing for the young, like for the kids. Yeah. And, uh, but I mean, Bermondsey, I mean, London's changing now altogether though, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's a lot more upper class people in London now. Mm. You know, so yeah, I just think it's interesting, mate. Cause I've been in, I've been living in London in uh, North London for the last eight years. Yeah, but every time I go back out to where my parents are, I feel much more now, much more relaxed, much more at home. I yeah, can, yeah, yeah. I probably you, you do. You put on, you put on a front when you come to London. Yeah. I, I, I believe that. I believe mm. that. You know, you you walk changes. It is crazy, but it's it's in your mind. You know, yeah. it's in your mind, but it's it is mad. It is mad. Yeah, it's interesting. All right, mate. So we do the same three questions at the end of every episode. Yeah. So the first of these three is, is, is there anything you've discovered or come across recently that you're particularly excited about? I think I might know what you're going to say. Yeah, my podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we haven't even spoke about it. Okay, go on. Yeah, yeah, What's the podcast, podcast all about? What are you going to be talking about? It's going to be boxing based. Um, but we, we want to talk about uh, just people's, people's life in general. You know what I mean? Not, not so much like what you've got here is great. Uh, but we, we just want to talk about everyday stuff, you know, as well and um, it's basically it's, it's called Journey Man so it's like kind of Journey of Man but we're going to have people's wives on we want to get people's wives on there talking about you know um, what's it like when your husband's in camp you know what's it like is it hard with the kids is it do you know what I mean so yeah just just a, a broad spectrum do you know what I mean nice. of, of, can you give us a little teaser of people you're going to have on I'm looking forward to listening myself we're going to have people from all, all, all different different uh, you know professions um, but is it boxing focused yeah yeah, it's good. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. It's gonna be. You know what I mean? I wanna, I wanna broaden it a bit more than just boxing, though. Do you know okay. what I mean? Because my life's been everywhere. Do you know what I mean? I'll tell so, you, who should, you should get on. Who's that? Your surgeon. Yeah, I'm getting him on. Don't worry about that. Oh, That's yeah. done. Yeah. Amazing. Done. Yeah. All right. I've got, I've got, yeah, I've got, I've got the, I've got the surgeon coming on. I've got a consultant coming on. Yeah. I've got, um, I've got a uh, my mind man coming on. Yeah. Um, I've got Ricky Atten, Tyson Fury. Billy Joe Saunders. I mean, the list goes on. Epic. You know what I mean? All right, mate. Well, let us know when it's going live, and yeah, uh, yeah I'll let all, all the listeners know for take flight as well. Definitely, definitely. Gonna have a listen. Okay, mate. The next one of these three is: if there was one practice or a habit or routine that every listener should incorporate into what they do daily, that's going to help them drive their performance. What would that one habit or practice be? Firstly, wake up um, with a clear mind. Um, be positive. Do you know what I mean? Because there's always someone worse off out there than you. Um, and maybe just a little bit of exercise, even if it, even if it's just to start with a walk. Do you know what I mean? It, it, you know, um, there's good books to go and get. You know, you've got the secret. 
You've got um, The Power. You've got some very good books out of there. Just positive thinking books mm. because it gets the mindset right, you know, and uh, sets you up for a great day. What's your exercise regime looking like now? Yeah, I'm getting back into it. Um, started with, um, I started with a 200 metre run. Yeah. Uh, knackered after 200 <laughs> metres. Um, I'm up to about a mile and a half now. Yeah. So I'm, do, I'm doing Amazing. well. Amazing. I'm doing well. It's so inspiring. And what's the, is that like part of the rehab then to slowly build that up? Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, uh, I mean, they don't want me doing things like that straight away, but I'm, 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 that's the way I am as a person, you know, and my consultant said to me, listen, if that's how you are, we don't want you to go mental, but if that's how you are, that's how you are. I mean, yeah. I'm back swimming there. I'm back, uh, I, vi- I, vi- I ate a bag the other day for the yeah. first time. Um, yeah, so that's it. Just, just got to keep fo- focused, positive. Amazing. I love it. I'm training with John Ryder next week, actually. So if you, if you ever want a training companion, mate, I'm up for yeah, a little yeah, burn. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. Definitely, definitely. But oh. uh, yeah, no, I just want to, I want to get back to doing, I want to get back, I may, may be doing fundraisers and things like that and maybe triathlons and things like that. I've got, to, I've got to stay competing and doing something, you know. The London Triathlon next summer, they've just done it this year. It looks really good fun. Is it good? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, I hate being this heavy. I, I hate being this heavy and do you know what I mean? And listen, the only thing that's going to get this off is hard work. So yeah. That's Great message. All right, mate. And the last of these three is, if you imagine that there's two versions of yourself. Now, I normally pinpoint a particular time in your life, but there's there's so many examples we could use for you. But if you imagine you're in one of the particularly difficult times, yeah. what's the key differentiator or key trait between the version of yourself who goes on to have all the success you've had, the strong mindset and all the rest of it, and yeah. the, the guy who sat opposite me now, and the other version, the one who wouldn't have achieved all these things, who kind of lies by the, the wayside. What's the key difference, the key trait between those two people? Well, again, it's going back to your mind, isn't it? It's going back to your mindset. I mean, um, listen, we can all, I could have easily just said, oh yeah, I'm going to go and drink, I'm going to go and do this, I'm going to go and do that. But again, it's all it, all it is is about being positive. Listen, I ain't sitting here saying that I'm always positive because I do have down times, I do have bad times, I do have hard times, but... I find ways out of them and there is techniques to get out of them. There is techniques. And the problem is in this day and age, we're going back to it again about medication and things like that. But people are too quick taking medication mm-hmm. instead of trying other um, you know, avenues. Yeah. And um I think if anyone's watching this video now, I think just just try it once and see how you feel. Maybe leave a message or whatever afterwards about it. But uh go out, do a little walk, clear your head. Um and just try and sit there and do a bit of positive thinking, you know. There's always something positive in your life than what's going on in someone else's life. Mm. That's the way you got to look at it. Yeah, it's interesting as well, the whole positive thinking or visualisation stuff, like something that Conor McGregor's massive on as well, talks about loads, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, if you if you, if you visualise it, you can do it. Trust me. I used to sit there, even before I thought going, I used to have a black and white telly in front of me, like black, you know, the specs of black and white, and I used to picture myself knocking him out. Hmm. And standing over him, and do you know the do you know the um, the picture I, I looked at? Muhammad Ali against Sonny Liston. We're standing over him, and if you look at oh, I can't that picture, him. and you look at my fight against Gomez, the way I was standing over him when he was on the floor, yeah, it was crazy. I've, I, I visualized it. I visualized that he was, you know, it, that, that that was going to happen, and it happened. Do you get what I mean? So, yeah. I, I, people think they're mad when they see it visualizing, and when they're sitting there doing positive thinking, but you don't realize how good that is for your brain. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? And just clearing your own your whole mind out, you know? Amazing. Mate, thank you so much. There's been so many amazing things you've said today. I think they're gonna help loads of people. Thank you very I think much. Your, your mindset is incredible. And uh, I wish you all the best with your with your recovery and everything, mate. You, you don't look like anything's ever even happened yeah, to you. Yeah, no, you definitely li- listen, all, all I hope, it, even if it helps one person, even if it helps one person yeah. not to take their life, you know what I mean? Because all you've got to think about is the people you leave behind if you do take your life. And uh it, people say it's a selfish thing, but listen, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have the guts to do it. But um, and I know some people just. But if you're ever thinking about doing it, just try and you know stay positive, stay focused, and move on. Thanks, Peter. I really appreciate it. Cheers, thank you. Cheers, mate. If you like that, give us a like, comment, and a subscribe. You big dosser. <laughs>